All right. Well, it's great to be here. Um, you know, when we learn about science as kids in school, we're often given lists of things to memorize. We're often given, you know, the names of the planets or the elements of the periodic table. But I like to think of science as a mystery story, a heist story, right? You're trying to crack into a vault and find the secrets within. And you've got your team, and you have the technology, and you've got to figure out how to put the plan together. And right now, one of the most exciting areas to try to tackle is the brain itself. How does the brain in our heads, that three pound lump of matter, generate our thoughts and our feelings and our actions? And because of new technologies, I would argue, maybe this is starting to fall within grasp. Now, the brain is really complicated. Within a cubic millimeter of your brain, you're gonna have on the order of 100,000 cells called neurons that have these spindly shapes and are very, very complexly organized. And these cells compute using electricity. And these cells are wired up in extremely complicated networks that process information, talking to each other by exchanging chemicals. And so it's incredibly uh, complex, but the rewards of understanding the brain, of course, would be enormous, right? Of course, there's obviously the thing where we understand a lot more about ourselves. What's it like to be a human? And what causes our thoughts? And why do we do what we do? There are practical implications. Could we build better algorithms, maybe even artificial intelligences that could help us solve intractable problems? But how do you get that map? How do you actually figure out what the brain looks like? One thing that's somewhat difficult to appreciate is the staggering scale of the circuitry in, in our brain. If you took one human brain and you had some magical way where you could swallow it up and blow it up until it was the size of a city block, the connections between those cells would still be very, very small, maybe around the size of a grain of sand. And the cells themselves would be visible, um, but the actual connections and molecules would be barely visible at all. So how can you see such a thing? How can you understand such a thing? How can you actually acquire these kinds of maps? Now, there are many ways that people are trying to understand the brain. I think we've all seen brain scans, often done with magnetic resonance imaging. And you see these pictures that look very beautiful that show little dots lighting up in the brain. And we've learned a lot through magnetic resonance imaging activity measurement of the brain. But each of those dots actually contains thousands to millions of cells with millions to billions of connections. And we know that even individual cells next to each other in the brain can do very different things. One might recognize an object, the other might recognize a face. They're all intermeshed in complex patterns. So how could you build a tool that would let you actually see all that stuff? Well, MRI is very powerful because you can use it to study the living brain of even living humans like you or me. But in recent years, a lot of people started to look at technologies for looking at preserved brain tissues, either from brain banks or from animal models that are commonly studied in neuroscience because we want to be able to test therapies, for example, um, and mechanisms thereof before going to humans. And so microscopy has been extremely important, being able to magnify images and to zoom in and see those tiny, tiny features. But it turns out microscopy is not quite good enough. Light has a finite size, and so you can't see things below a certain size limit. You can't see individual atoms or molecules just by putting them under a microscope. And so that's annoying. But people have been trying very hard to overcome this. In fact, in 2014, some of the inventors of so-called super-resolution microscopes won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. And there are very elaborate tricks you can play to try to see things that are very, very, very small. It comes at a cost, though. These technologies work slowly. It's hard to see objects that are really, really large, like a brain circuit. And so one thing that's sort of interesting to think about is, well, how do we crack this problem? How do we hack into this brain circuitry using technologies or developing technologies that will allow us to overcome the limits and to bridge this gap? So we're a technology inventing group at the MIT Media Lab. And we decided to try to take inspiration from uh, the world around us and to try to understand how maybe some of these treasures are hiding in plain sight. And one of the reasons why these technologies are important is not just out of the academic interest of understanding the brain, and not just because we want to develop better computers. There's also a moral imperative because of the large prevalence of brain disorders. So brain disorders are, of course, some of the most intractable conditions that we face in the health and medical enterprise. And if you look at this list, Alzheimer's disease and stroke um, and traumatic brain injury, Many of these disorders not only affect our time to live, but they, they change who we are, our identity, how we relate to loved ones, our family members, and so forth. And so 
I feel like this is sort of at the crux of the matter. The brain is so complicated that for almost none of these diseases do we actually know what's really going on. How do all these neurons and cells and networks in our brain change? And since we have no way of mapping all those changes, we are left trying to ch hunt down specific hypotheses or uh, guesses of what's happening in the brain. But so far, we haven't been able to really fully cure anything, and the treatments are few and far between, and they often have side effects. So how can we, an invention group, a design group that's trying to tackle brain science from an inventive standpoint, actually make a contribution? Well, we like to take this sort of hacking into the vault of the secrets of the universe very seriously. We want to start with by taking the actual problem and attacking it from every possible size. We're not going to test hypothesis necessarily. We're going to think of every possible way of solving the problem. And it turns out that inspiration um, it can be found in all sorts of interesting um, everyday objects and, and interesting uh, chemistries and te technologies that have been around for a very long time. So it turns out that for half a century now, people have been studying swellable polymers. These are chemicals that are dense when you start, and then when you add water, they swell and become larger. And so I think many of us have had encounters with this kind of technology, the baby diaper. Um, and so what we thought was, why don't we try to take seriously that metaphor that I told you about earlier, to take a brain and swell it up until the individual building blocks became visible and apply it to actual preserved brain circuitry. So here's a schematic of what a baby diaper polymer looks like when it's really small and condensed. This is before the baby has done its business on it. And so those little wires um, represent the polymer chains. These are the chemicals that wind their way in a complex mesh. And when you add water, it'll actually swell up and become bigger. For the aficionados, what's happening is you're washing out a positive charge, sodium, and there's negative charge left that's stuck. And so light charges repel, and it has to get bigger. But anyway, the point here is that you can take a material that's very compact, and by adding water, you can swell it up. And so what if we actually try to do that inside an actual brain? So here's a piece of brain tissue. This is actually a preserved piece of mouse brain because mice are very commonly used in neuroscience as a model that can accurately be used to study many kinds of features of neural computation and disease. And what we did, what we did was take this preserved piece of mouse brain tissue, wash in the little building blocks of the baby diaper polymer, and cause them to assemble into those fine little wires, but right there in the brain tissue, winding their way around molecules, inside cells, between cells, winding their way all the way through the brain tissue, like a very even mesh that permeates it completely and evenly. And then, when we add water, we can actually grow the brain, physically, right in front of your very eyes. And we were able to swell it by about 100-fold in volume. And suddenly, the things that are invisible because they're too tiny have now become large, and you can see them. So since this is kind of a crazy way of doing microscopy, I, we made this animation to try to explain um, how this works. This is uh, an animation created by uh, the two grad students in our group who have been spearheading this project, Paul Tilberg and Fei Chen. And so here's our artist rendition of a neuron, maybe not quite as impressive as some of the artists, other artists' work at this um, wonderful conference. And so what we do is we create certain kinds of anchors that will let us actually take the biomolecules in this neuron and couple them to the baby diaper polymer. Then we wash in the little building blocks of the baby diaper polymer until they're very even, and then we trigger the formation of those meshes, so they wind their way all the way through the cells and around the cells, in between the molecules and around the molecules. And then, when we add water, we can actually find that it's possible to swell the polymer, and the brain comes along for the ride. We can actually physically make all those parts bigger. And it's even, so although you can't see things that are very small, because light has a finite size, in this case, you can actually move the molecules as far apart as you want, essentially. So why is this good then? Well, for the first time now, we can actually image large circuits in the brain and zoom in all the way into individual connections between cells. So right here at the top is a piece of the brain that's involved with memory formation, amongst other things, called the hippocampus. And in green are various neurons, and in blue and magenta are those connections between cells. And at the top, you have this incredible large circuit formed of all these neurons and their connections. But going to the lower left, you can zoom in further, and then on the lower right, you can zoom even further until you can see an individual connection, which is what we have in the lower right there. So this is very powerful. You can now take complex organs like the brain and start to really hone in on the individual building blocks, crossing all those levels of description in order to appreciate the whole, not just 
in terms of its component, component parts, but how they're actually configured, how information must be flowing down these electrical pipes within the cells and at the chemical junctions between them. And so our hope now is that we can start to actually map entire circuits, the kinds of circuits that in the brain process memory formation, that govern our actions, and that help us actually move and think and feel. Now, interestingly, this can be applied to the human brain. So far, everything I've told you about is chemistry. And we can apply those chemistries to all sorts of different uh, tissues. This is a sample of human brain tissue uh, that's been processed by some of our collaborators. And they did the very same process that we did um, at MIT on the mouse brain samples. And they were able to physically blow up pieces of the human brain. So again, the invisible becomes big enough to see and you can then visualize it. And so one hope now is we can start to try to confront some of these medical mysteries. What causes Alzheimer's disease? Why does a circuit in the brain start to generate seizures and cause epilepsy? What rewirings occur when memories are being remembered or, as often happens, become forgotten? And so that's kind of where we are now. We're now starting to figure out how to use this technology to actually try to understand the inner workings of the brain and how those changes occur um, in pathological states as well. Maybe we can try to hunt down the master control knobs, the things that we can go for therapeutically in order to fix intractable neurodegeneration. Now, with light microscopy, we're using light after all, we can have many colors. And this is really important because we can label all sorts of things. There are all sorts of different molecules in the brain. There are those that are, transmit information. There are those that listen to information. There are those that generate electrical pulses and those that, that interpret them. And of course, there are changes that occur in degeneration, such as the formation of plaques in Alzheimer's or the change in certain brain cells that cause them to die in Parkinson's disease. And so one hope now is we can start to color code all these building blocks of the brain, both normal and abnormal, in order to pinpoint how those changes occur. So what we found in the recent months, we only presented this uh, technology for the first time around the beginning of this year, is that there are many questions in medicine that are also in great need for the ability to look at very complex systems that are all the way down to those molecular building blocks. We've been approached by cancer biologists. Tumors, after all, like the brain, are large objects, but the pathology is beginning with these nanoscale insults with changes that are invisible. The immune system, what causes the immune system to attack and cause an autoimmune disease, something that has a lot of personal resonance for myself, since many people in my family have autoimmune disorders. If we could figure out what causes a cell to attack the pancreas and cause diabetes, or to attack the intestine and cause Crohn's disease, maybe we could try to actually map these molecules and to see how those attacks occur, and can we then develop targeted ways of blockading them? So one of our hopes is really to deploy this throughout medicine. Can we actually bring medicine to the point where we have the ground truth maps of what's going wrong? And that's important because so many diseases, the really intractable ones, if you will, are about our body fighting ourselves. We've had a pretty good go at attacking bacteria and viruses through antibiotics. It's not been perfect, of course, and there are issues like antibiotic resistance where they're fighting back. But the really tough diseases, the ones where a lot of us have no idea what to do, often occur because it's our body rebelling against ourselves. When we have a brain disorder, an autoimmune disease, a cancer, those are our cells that have gone awry, and they're changing in ways and that's, uh, that are very subtle, right? And so one part of the reason why it's so hard to solve these problems is that how can you fix a broken part of the body when it's very similar to the parts that are around it? And so by mapping systematically the building blocks of life, but across length scales that are important in order to understand complex problems like cancer and brain function, we're hoping to make those master maps of mechanisms and hunt down systematically all these changes in order to make sure we're not missing anything. So I think you know, one of the things that's been really fun uh, with our group at the MIT Media Lab has been realizing that you know, by thinking backwards from the problem and thinking about it from a design standpoint, you know, hacking into the vault of secrets of the universe isn't so hard. Very often, the technologies are hiding in plain sight. And to paraphrase Proust, wisdom is often not just about going to new landscapes, but having new eyes. And that's our hope for what we can do for brain science and for medicine. Thank you.